So now that our app is connected to a MySQL database, we'll need to create a database table to store our user's data. The standard way to create a database table is to do so through your favorite database management program. This is a totally valid way to create a table. However, when it comes to our app scalability, it's important to take the pros and cons of this method into consideration. The pro of creating a database table through a GUI is that it's fast. A GUI's purpose is to improve a user's experience and streamline tasks that would otherwise be too time consuming if they're performed solely through the command line. However, let's think of a few scenarios. What would happen if we accidentally deleted a table or even worse, our database? Well, we better hope that we have a backup stored somewhere or else our data could be gone for good. How about a scenario where we need to share our database with other developers across a team? We'd have to export our database directly, then send the other developers a file that they can import into their system. And what if these other team members begin making changes to the database? Things can start to get tricky as you need a way to track who updates what tables, which tables or columns you should export and distribute, and so forth. As a result, when it comes to creating a database that has some sort of contingency plan in case anything were to get deleted, or if we need to share our database with other developers, we're going to be using what are known as database migrations. A database migration is a simple JavaScript file that determines how your database is structured. You can define tables, columns, and relationships all within these files. Once your structure is defined, you can migrate your structure up to your database using your migrations up function. Or if you've decided something in your structure is incorrect and you've already run your migrations, you can undo things by running a migrations down function. By defining structure inside of a file, we can store this file in version control so other developers can consistently keep track of who has added what tables or columns throughout our app's database. In addition, by keeping these structure-like files in version control, we have a robust backup system in which we can always restore our database's structure if we were to accidentally delete a table or the database as a whole. As a result, we're not going to create our database structure by using a GUI like SQL Pro. We're going to be using a migration library instead, specifically SQLize CLI. We installed SQLize CLI in the last video to scaffold our SQLize config required to get our app connected to a database. Not only does SQL ICLA generate configuration files, but it also comes with a set of functions that create and run migrations. Let's test this out to see what a migration file actually looks like. Open up your terminal, and from your project root, run npx sqlize migration generate dash dash name users. This migration file is where we will begin to create the structure for our user table. Now let's think to ourselves, what kind of user data do we need to actually store? Most apps require an email in order to log in, so storing users' email seems like a good place to start. Let's specify what table we want to target by taking this return statement out of the comments. If we were to run this migration as is, SQLize would create a table called users within our database and give it one column, ID, which would be restricted to just integers as specified right here. However, in order to ensure our database is as robust as possible, we'll want to specify a few additional rules for our ID column. For instance, what if we want to specify that our ID should auto increment whenever a new row is added to our table? Well, this migration file is a place where we would do just that. Instead of referencing this integer type directly, we're going to set our ID property equal to an empty object instead. And inside of this empty object, we'll add a type property, which we will set to sqlize.integer. This specifies that the only kind of data that can be entered into our ID column is a number. We'll also add an auto increment property and set it equal to true so that whenever a new row is created, our ID will be automatically incremented based on whatever ID is present in the previous row. So if we have something like one in the first row, whenever we add a row after that, the ID is going to be equal to two. If we add another row, the ID would be equal to three and so forth. Then finally, we'll add a primary key property, which we will also set to true. And this enforces a rule stating that our ID must be unique and that it can never be empty. 
So when we create a new row, we can't create a new row unless the ID field has something inside of it and it can't be equal to any other ID in any previous rows. By setting these three properties, we're ensuring that we have a way to uniquely identify a user because no row can have the same ID, nor can a row's ID ever be empty. Now that we have a way to uniquely identify each row within our user's table, let's add that email column, which will hold all of our user's emails. To add an email column right below our ID object, we'll add an object property called email. And just like we did with our ID column, we need to specify a type, which we'll set equal to sqlize.string, since an email is technically just a string of characters. Then we'll also add a unique property and set it equal to true. This will specify that no two emails inserted into our table can be the same. So my email is chris at chriscourses.com. If I make a row with chris at chriscourses.com, no one else can create a row with that same email in our database. And as a finishing touch for our migration, it's pretty common to use Pascal casing for actual database tables. So instead of stating that we wanna create a user's table with a lowercase u, we'll make this u uppercase instead. And this is really just a preference thing, but most of the databases that I've seen across different app projects that I've worked on do use this Pascal casing. So I wanna to try to be as consistent as possible with those other apps and other projects that I'm working on. So you should try to do the same, but in the end, you can definitely just use whichever one you prefer. Now to run this migration and create schema within our database, we we'll wanna make sure our file is saved and then open up our terminal. SQL ICLI comes with a number of commands to manage migrations, but the most important one is DB Migrate, which will run any migrations that haven't been executed yet. So let's run npx SQLize db migrate. And you'll see that our database migration was successful. We can confirm this by opening up a database management program such as SQL Pro, which is what I use, and then selecting our database. Once you select your database, you should now see a user's table that contains two columns, ID and email. If we try to insert a new row of data here, you'll notice ID will always be populated by an integer and that no two emails may be the same as we specified within our original migration file. And this is the whole reason we use a database to store data in the first place. It ensures that the data we're inputting into it is always the data we expect it to be, at least almost always better chance than using Excel or some sort of spreadsheet program. In addition to an email, we'll also want to store a user's password so they have a way to log into our app. So let's add a password property. And the only restriction we'll add is to specify that this password should always be a string. Now, if we try running our migrations again, you'll notice that nothing happens and that's because technically we've already ran the migration for this file. If we want to run this migration again with its additional columns, we either have to create a new migration file that adds on to this table that we already created, or we'll have to undo the last migration we ran and then just run all of our migrations again. It's pretty common to use both at some point in time when you're developing, but it's less time consuming at the moment to simply undo the last migration. So to undo the last migration, we'll want to use our migrations down function. Our migrations down function is ran whenever we use the SQLi CLI command, db migrate undo. But in order to actually remove the schema that we just pushed up to our database, we'll want to take the example code located in the functions comment and then just like we did with the up function, we want to place this code in a place where it can actually be ran. So we'll just place it right outside of the comments. And now that this is uncommented, when we save the file and run npx sqlize db migrate undo, our original migration should be reverted, which you can confirm by refreshing your database in whatever database program you're using and looking to see whether or not your user table still exists. And now that our database is clean, we can rerun our migration with the new password column the same way we did before with npx sqlize db migrate. And now when we refresh our database, you'll see that we have a password field added onto our user's table along with ID and email. 
So a word of advice when you are undoing migrations. Undoing migrations will delete all and any data associated with the table you are rolling back. You can really only use the undo function if you're within a development environment using unimportant data. But you can also undo migrations in staging and sometimes even production, but you really need to make sure you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you can cause some big issues for your users, your app, or maybe even the company in which you're developing the app for. All in all, migrations are like version control for your database. We can take snapshots of when tables, columns, and relationships were all added to our database by different developers at different times so that we can ensure our database is always up to date when we are developing locally and that our database is always up to date within our staging and production environments. It's much easier to manage your database with migration files than to just export whatever schema you need between your team because I guarantee you, as I mentioned, I've done that before and it is a pain in the butt to track what tables you changed, what columns you changed and so forth, just to make sure that everyone's databases are in sync. So now that we've run our migrations, we have a spot where we can store our user submitted data. We'll be utilizing SQLize further in the next video to store this data in the cleanest, most secure manner possible. So let's continue and I'll see you there right now.